Welcome to the podcast. We're street smart, business smart, all kinds of smart people share their insights into the world of marketing, career journeys, and personal growth. So sit back and prepare to get enlightened with your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Tribe, let's get back to basics here. TA in recruiting. My guest today, JP Elliott, is the vice president of talent management for Dick Sporting Goods, and he's responsible for leading the talent strategy and all talent acquisition, learning, development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives across the enterprise. And prior to taking this role, JP was a senior vice president of HR for the Brinks Company, an earlier tenure at Lenovo, one of the real big boys in computer manufacturing. And along the way, he took a slight detour from the world of HR and co-founded a successful brand strategy and design firm that featured clients like Warner Brothers, Fox, and my favorite Lego, to name a few. And JP received his PhD in organizational psychology from the Lyon International University, where he served as an adjunct instructor and developed an advanced seminar on talent management. This man knows what he's talking about. And most importantly, JP lives in Pittsburgh with his beautiful wife, Christina, and two wonderful children, Hudson and Harper. We'll talk about family life, work life, and a whole lot more. JP, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Adam. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Thanks for the great introduction. Awesome. Good stuff. So I think I gave a really, really good background, a good overview of kind of your career journey. We'll certainly talk a little bit more about that. But one question I always like to ask folks who are in our industry, how and why HR and talent? How'd you get into this game? Oh, man, it's a great question. I think, you know, I used to think I made a a conscious choice to be in HR. Um, I've now looked back in my life and realized I've always been in HR. And it was sort of uh, ingrained. My dad had a PhD in economics. um, And my mom was a marriage and family counselor. So it was a mix of business and people. It always kind of you know kind of came together for me, and then um, I was a peer helper in high school. I was part of the key club. Um, I mean, as I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, I was kind of geeky. Uh, and then in college, I uh, couldn't make the tennis team and get a scholarship, so I ended up becoming a resident advisor to pay the bills because it was free room and board. And next thing you know, uh, I was doing that for a few years, and then was vice president for student life, and then went right to grad school. Uh, but I never thought HR, you know, because HR's got a bad rap a little bit, right? right? It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's like, oh, it's the, the rules and, you know, it's um, about the it's policies tough. and it's hiring and firing and all this stuff, right? And um, I really want to be more in consulting. I want to do more, something more strategic. I uh, couldn't get a business. I probably wasn't going to get in the top 10 MBA schools. So I went and went for my PhD. Uh, and, you know, no one really ever asked you to get your PhD from because, frankly, after you write, that long giant paper at the end. Um, that's all that really matters. And I did that and I went and started my career. So I think it was always this intersection of helping people, but really mostly focus on the business piece and understand how that comes to life with people, organizations, processes, et cetera. So. Right. And that's, and that's awesome. Cause there's a lot of people in this profession that are focusing on the people and, and not the business. And I think, and I'd love to get your perspective on this, but the trend now of modern HR and talent is really that, that combination. I think some companies call it HR business partner, but really understanding the business objectives of a company and combining it with the people and talent goals. Let's talk a little bit about that kind of perspective that you bring to Dick Sporting Goods. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I'd love to say I bring that perspective, but hopefully a lot of the great, I think, forward looking HR folks, this is where, this is what the business wants from us. They're, they're basically saying, look, you could take a humanistic point of view and be all about the people, or you're going to take a capitalistic point of view about making money. And Mark Efron's done some work on this, but really capitalism wins. Um, but unfortunately, while capitalism differentiates the top performing HR people, humanistic point, viewpoint really dominates. And so, you know, I think coming out from number one, like we're in a business to make money, right? Right. It's a business, of course. It's a business. We want to make treat people right. We want to make sure people are happy and engaged and come to work. But at the end of the day, we're about making money. So I think where HR folks start to fall down is that they're not reading the Wall Street Journal. They're not reading Fortune Magazine or Business Week. You know, they're not looking at the, the P&L. Um, maybe they're even intimidated by understanding what a P&L is. You have to get comfortable with that stuff first and then sit down with leaders and say, what makes the business tick? And it doesn't have to be academic. It could be like, let's go to the warehouse. Let's go to talk to my teammates. 
you know, how does it actually happen day in day? And how do you actually make money, right? Start thinking about that from a more of a, a business perspective. And then you start to see, well, there's opportunities to improve the employee experience, improve the customer experience, you know, by pulling some levers that HR folks do. Well, it's interesting too, because I think a lot of companies historically, you mentioned it earlier, that they look at HR as just a, a resource, a, a function of it. Um, and that's because HR is not, and talent is not a profit center. But I think the real shift is when companies really understand that your employees are your product and that generates profit. Um, so how do you work with, with, with both the executives, right, to really get that kind of message and mindset across? And then in turn, you know, working with hiring managers to really prioritize people. Yeah, I think, you know, it's um, you, hopefully you're, you've chosen a great organization that just understands and gets it that they're about people first. I mean, let's to be really be clear. Not every organization, their competitive advantage is not people. I mean, we'd love to say that and we'd love to say people are our greatest product. asset. But a lot of times companies are not being a little bit disingenuous with that. So I think with good leaders, the first piece is, you know, do they get it? And if you're an HR partner um, and you can hopefully pick where you want to work as you're thinking about that, you want those leaders to say, I get how a people impact my leadership can set the vision, drive the strategy, get people motivated. And then how do you bring that to life every day? Hiring managers, you know, it's going to be hit or miss. I think you're consistently inconsistent on how they're going to view talent, right? Absolutely. And some are great and some, um, they don't get it. And so I could definitely go all day about, you know, how hiring managers should be. But I think at the HR's job is to figure out how's this person fit, why they agree it fit, how do we help you, you know, see that and see that potential, and then you know make that uh, match. Uh, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit about your, your your formal education. You've invested a ton of time, passion, effort into it, and you really understand from a academic standpoint organizational psychology. But rubber hits the road. I mean, in our world, our commodity human beings, it's the X factor. We're dealing with emotions. We're dealing with personalities. We're dealing with people's lives. Like, so where have you seen that disconnect? I, I'd love to get an example of something that you learned in school. Maybe it was you know, a, a concept, a philosophy, but when it comes into practice in the real world, there's a disconnect. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the funny part about this is, um, you know, I think, I think it's great. Formal education is terrific. But if we really start to get real, you know, what a college education does, whether it's an undergrad or master's or PhD, it just shows you are willing to put in the effort to complete something. That is why people get a PhD. All it means is that uh, I may not be smarter than the guy sitting next to me or the woman sitting next to me, but yes, I um, went to school for seven years and I wrote a 150 page dissertation, good which by the way, I broke up with a girl I was dating and, and, and wrote that in seven months because I was, uh, I basically procrastinated. I was partying too much at the time. And so I had to <laughs> kind of double down and get that done. But then you come to the real world and you learn all that and it's academic to your point. <clears throat> and then what it really matters is where you get that first job. Who are you learning from? And, and I think the first 10 to 15 years of your career, it's all about learning. It's, it's more about who you work for and what the job is than even the money. That's where you start to really get at your PhD or your MBA. Yeah, the, the, the real world there. So you talk, you talk about the concept of building a career. Let's unpack that a little bit um, for my audience here. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, I think number one, the, the biggest advice I get is people are like, oh, you know, um, I really, I'm not sure what I want to do with my career. You know, how did you get to do what you do? And they're always kind of fishing to figure out like, is it going to fit for them? And that's good. You need to explore. But most importantly, you have to make a decision and you have to have a vision for where you want to go. If I sit down with someone and they say to me, I want to be an HR business partner. I want to be a, you know, executive recruiter. Great. You know what? I can help you think about solutions. I can, people I can introduce you to, experiences you can get to go become those things. If you don't have a goal, I can't help you. And so that's the biggest thing for most people when you think about that career. Now, of course, you don't always know what you want to do right away. So as you get out there, it's okay to explore. And that's what a lot of millennials do. And I think, frankly, boomers and Gen X, we all did the same thing. We just called it different, different things. We didn't have Find, finding, finding ourself, I think. It yeah, was you're finding yourself. Finding. Yeah, I mean, it's like the quarter-life crisis, you know, all that good stuff. So once you kind of get to know, hey, what do I, what do I like to do? Well, then it's how you find the right opportunities and you've got to make those opportunities yourself. And I think you've got to think longer than the first job you have, right? So when I think about jobs, I'm thinking about not the job that I get with the that current job, but what does this job get me for the next role? So I'm always thinking one role ahead because that's the way you think about building a career, right? Does this help me get the job that I want two jobs down? If right. it doesn't do it, then maybe it's the wrong job. But so many folks these days, especially younger folks, and not just say younger folks, because I see it all the time. I mean, I'm an in the trenches recruiter, and I have this conversation all the time with candidates that I'm like, listen, look, yes, this immediate job has to fit 
and be good for you. But when you're interviewing, ask about, you know, the next step ahead, right? right. You're interviewing, like say you're a senior manager and you're interviewing with the director, find out what they did to get to that job. How long did that take? Like, always, it's, it's, it's chess versus yes. checkers. And I think so many people are short-sighted because they're always thinking about, and rightfully so, right? When you think about if in the candidate perspective, right? You're thinking about getting out of a job that either you don't like for one reason or another, you're not being valued, you're not getting advancement, you're not getting all the opportunities, all those, all those factors that you're only thinking about the immediate next step instead of a couple of steps ahead. Um, so let's talk about the candidate experience for a little bit, something that you champion. Um, what are some things that, that Dix is doing fantastic around creating an ultimate candidate experience? And one quick thing that I've kind of been playing around with is this idea that HR, internal recruiters, are, are your brand ambassadors. They're the first touch point that right. any new employee who's coming into your family and your organization is going to have and how critical that experience has to be. So I'd love to get your insight on what Dix is doing well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we even go back as, in the career piece a little bit too at some point because I want to, you know, I think there's yes, other, I, other ideas there. But, of course. you know, it's really about what story are you selling? You know, how are you telling your story? What's the narrative to that recruiter so they can be your brand ambassador? Um, that's really important. And I think, you know, what we try to do at Dick's Sporting Goods, we're in Pittsburgh. You know, frankly, Pittsburgh, it's a great town, but a lot of people don't want to move to Pittsburgh unless they've got family, you know, around here. And right. so we have people that kind of come in and out. Um, and so what we had to do is we had to build a brand. And we've done that in a couple spaces. And technology, we've built uh, an, a huge brand. We've hired and moved to agile product teams. We've hired over uh, 150 to almost 200 probably um, product managers, UX designers, software engineers. And what we started thinking about, how did we change mm -hmm. our brand? We literally decided to start something called the DSG Tech Talk Thursdays. And so basically once a month, we host these awesome speakers come in and for the tech community. And we're not actually selling anything. We're like, all we're just doing is basically trying to get back and build the community of technology to kind of really now set, oh, wow, Dick Sporting Goods actually has technology guys there. Maybe we should think about that. Real, real tech. And, real and, tech. You're, and you're establishing and, and showcasing Dix as a, as a thought leader in that space. Exactly. Right, a lot of people are probably just thinking about the front end experience of a retail operation, but really there's so much more to it. I mean, the e so side, the, how, how big, how big, how many employees does Dix have uh, nationwide? About 40,000 and we've got 2,800 in our corporate, corporate headquarters here in, in Pennsylvania and uh, Pittsburgh. It's big. Yeah. We've got about 700 people, probably 600 people in our technology team. You know, that's growing every day. So that was one of the things we had to do. So we obviously had to have much more of a curated experience. And I think what most companies, the biggest problem they have is that, Especially if you've got a big brand name. So if you're Apple or Amazon, you know, look, all the names, companies we can go off. It doesn't they, work for you. They, they just select. They yeah, don't it's work a heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they've got so many applicants that, frankly, you're kind of cogging the wheel sometimes, right? Whereas a smaller company has to work a little harder. We have to recruit, you know, so we build a relationship. So what we've done on the candidate experience side uh, <clears throat> is not only do we have a great team, I think, that obviously makes that connection. But once we bring you in into the office, you know, we typically, if you're a director above and above, we have someone walking you around that gives you a tour. We give every one of our candidates a tour of the entire building because it's a huge selling point. But the directors, we've got someone who's outside there and kind of walking them to every one of their interviews. We get to know them a little bit and we actually send packages out sometimes afterwards with like swag and things like that for their families, especially with the executive level. It's nice. Um, we, when you do kind of then, of course, join with us, we send you a little hiring packet that gets um, – water bottles, some other stuff in there, really just unexpected gifts from us. And it's, it's, it's mostly about building the relationship. I mean, you, at the end of the day, the candidate experience is about the manager. Are they following up? Are they calling you? Right. Our team tries to do a really, they really good job want you. That. Yeah, we really want you. And, you know, I don't know if it's perfect because no company is perfect, but we want to make sure that when you come here, you are a customer for Dick's Sporting Goods, hopefully, and you'll still be a customer even if you don't get the job. I so it. it's, a big, it's a big focus for us. There. Yeah, absolutely. And what about that day one experience? I mean, I've seen companies, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but I've seen companies where like literally there's a break in communication where the hiring manager is not there on day one. They're on vacation. They're on something. And I'm like, how, how, how is this not communicated? The, the manager knows that the employee is starting. And they didn't communicate it to make sure that a VP, a C-suite executive right. was there just to greet them. I mean, there's nothing worse than coming in on day one and the person that hired you is, is gone. I mean, that's only one element of it, right? Yeah. It's really that's ensure that too. you're setting somebody up for success. So what are some best practices uh, within Dix? Yeah, we, you know, I think we're, we're still working to make this perfect. You know, we definitely have a, we have a really good day one process. Um, that day one is structured. So we have uh, facilitators, about five facilitators that rotate and through the HR team that do it. 
Uh, and it's basically, you know, starts at 8.30 or so. You get a coffee, you come in, um, you know, quick tour, of course. And then we go through a lot of the stuff around what is the exporting goods, our history and values. And then we actually drive, this part's pretty cool. Um, after lunch, we drive over to one of our local Dick's Sporting Goods and um, our Golf Galaxy is one of the brands we own. And they actually get to meet one of the store managers who gives them the tour of the store. It talks about how the role can impact. That, that was really pretty cool. And you're done by 3.30 and they get picked up by their manager who usually has at least an hour or 30 minute touch base with them and kind of gives them their onboarding plan. And so the onboarding plans, I mean, I will say again, some managers are great, some aren't as good, um, but most take it pretty seriously. And, you know, from there, you're ready to go. And the other piece I think that we're still working on is we do onboarding surveys. We're always trying to refine it. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the gaps can be sometimes the technology. I mean, frankly, like, you know, is your PC ready? It's the basics. I can't said, log in. I can't log in. Yeah. I need, it's too many systems I need to, like system overload, yeah, right? Like I mean, process paralysis. And that's just good, man. And those has to fall back on the managers because HR can't do all that work. They can take responsibility. Yeah, but I think overall, you got to think about what the onboarding is and how people start to get in. And then we have onboarding plans and templates. And most folks kind of know, hey, let's get to them to meet the team, certain leaders, et cetera, you know, for the first 30, 60, 90 days as you get integrated. That, that, that's pretty awesome too. So a lot of people are intimidated by large companies, right? They're, they're intimidated by the process. They're intimidated by, by jumping in. What's, what are some of those advantages to working in a, in a, in a big company um, that, that might, you know, kind of tip the scale a little bit for some people that are hesitant? Yeah, I think when you're in a big company, the big advantage uh, in large company is more opportunities. I mean, I think that is, um, and that's one thing that's great about Dick Sporting Goods. You know, we've got 2,800 people working here. You can start, in fact, um, HR has been a little bit of a magnet. We've had six people come from different parts of the functions, whether it's in finance or marketing or e-com, have moved into different roles in the HR team. We, now, we've been open to that talent, but they've also been open to making those risks. So I think you know, there's more resources. There are um, a lot of times just more opportunities for you to grow your career, but you've got to take advantage of it. You've got to network, right? And if a smaller company, you know, you may get topped out because now, hey, your boss is a director and she's not going anywhere. What are you going to do? Whereas here, it's like, you're not going to be, if you're a great performer, there's opportunities for you. You just have to make them happen. Um, The second thing, it could be some stability. I mean, it depends on how well they're doing in the industry. Yeah, is the bonus going to be better? You know, uh, and some people, I think, just do better in big companies, but you've got to be able to deal with politics. And, you know, all the stuff that happens in big companies, right? Initiatives start, they stop, you know. Um. You got to have a thick skin too in a big company too. There's a lot of factors, financial factors, things get, you know, shot down for, you got to kind of be okay sometimes with the reasons, right? I mean, you deal with this all the time at your level, right? Sometimes it just is what it is. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could be based on data or it could be executives feelings that that's just not how they want to move you know, forward. And something you worked on for six months is now, been thrown in the trash can and you know you say okay you know look hey you lives you learned and i hopefully you saved it someplace because it may come back in five years and you can use it again um but big companies offer a lot of advantages but i think it goes back to the career piece one what's the job you know and what are you going to be doing and how wide and, and what's the breadth and depth of that experience two who are you working for right do you feel like and I could give you an example of, you know, early in my career where I turned down a job and, and kind of how I got my career started where I didn't feel good about one of the, my bosses. It was very transactional. It felt like I was just going to be another kind of worker bee versus got to know me. And then third is like the company, the industry. Do you, is this company industry you want to be a part of? Because not only <clears throat> with that first choice or a couple first choices, it's going to set off other things, right? You have now experience in, I'm in retail. I have experience in retail. So guess what? Other retailers might call me. Well, if your experience is in technology and your software development, they're going to call for those jobs. But if you pick a job and it's waste management and you don't like it, but you worked there for seven years, guess what? You know waste management and most likely they're going to call you for waste management you jobs. Get pigeonholed. So you get pigeonholed a little bit. So you've got to think mm-hmm. those things through. And to your point of the chess versus checkers, that helps you make some good decisions, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, navig- navigating is tough. How many, how many people do you have on your team uh, underneath you? <clears throat> Uh, there's about 40 people on, on the team. That's, that's definitely sizable. So what kind of advice do you give to people on really how to navigate in a, in a large team, in a, in a large organization? Because that could be intimidating as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, you know, first people are people. And so I'm pretty approachable. And, um, you know, don't get too full of myself. So, I, you know, one of the things when I started, uh, I was taking over for someone who I guess didn't really fit. They're only been here about seven months. And so I think the team was pretty gun shy. And I guess I've been the third leader in a few years. 
And so I sat down with all 40 folks and just did meet and greets and just, but it wasn't, you know, like I wanted to know who they were, where they're from, a little bit more about them. And a lot of them started getting into their jobs. I was like, no, 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 back up. Are you from Pittsburgh? I want to get to know you. Yeah. And it was really about that. And of course I wanted to know what role they're in. And then I wanted what feedback and advice, what can we change? And so I think early on building that relationship was important. And then it's really about building the right team. I mean, you're only uh, at at the level that I'm at and, and, you know, and really frankly, the, the honor of leading this team, it's only because I've got a great team below me and half time I'm a figurehead, frankly, you know, it's like you're going to meetings and you're really representing the, the team's great work. Uh, the ambassador. That's really cool. Yeah. No, that, that's awesome. It's funny. And I, I was kind of smirking when you, when you said that and it reminded me, um, how old I was probably, it was 2007. Uh, I went over to Sirius XM and it was still a very young organization. Howard Stern were just coming on board at the time and I had an incredible manager, Debbie Ernst. Hope you're listening, Debbie. And she did something so awesome on the first day. Uh, at the time, there was two, two floors at Sirius. We had the broadcast floor, and then we had marketing and operations. She walked me around. It was probably two hours. She walked me around to almost every single person that she knew or didn't know and introduced me. She's like, you need to know everybody from the doorman to the janitor to security all the way up to the CEO. And I want you to know them, and I want you to, them to know you and put your face to them. Because a lot of times I was trafficking you know, marketing materials. I was getting yeah. legal approvals. And to have that personal relationship was critical. And I think that goes back to having a great manager who is really setting you um, up for success. And I think that's a great tip, um, you know, as well. So let's switch gears a little bit. And I want to talk about being an individual, a professional individual within the workplace and still having your personal brand, right? Like, how do you do that? How do you do that and, and be a thought leader and really have a presence, um, you know, online and in the professional world while you're in such a big organization? Yeah, I don't know if I've got this totally figured out. Um, you know, I probably shouldn't say this. I'm actually thinking about launching a podcast in 2020, so we'll see. Awesome. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's something that does – you want to be known for certain things, and I think it's more about making a difference. For me, you know, I, I just think HR, we have an inferiority complex, right? And it's a, it's a very strange and only function that ever that goes, you know, hey, uh, do we add value? I mean – Finance doesn't say, do you think the, our, uh, our spreadsheets add value, right? No, HR needs to do a better job. And so I'll make a difference that way. But as you start to think about internally, externally, number one is like, don't believe your own hype, right? So the reality is you've got a job to do. And, um, you know, what you may be kind of saying externally, here, these are things I think make sense. Hopefully they're the same things that you're saying internally. But sometimes they can be different, right? Because what happens in a company isn't always the best practice, right? We have to, it's just a consultant. You've got to meet the client where the client is. Uh, and so it can be a little bit of balance, right? But I think being clear with your boss, with your, your people around you, this is part of who you are, but it's not about, Very fair. it's not about you. It's not about me trying to build a brand in uh, Dick's Sporting Goods or on top of Dick's Sporting Goods as a good name, right? It's just more about here's what I think is important. Here's what I want to share. And here's how I want to give back to the HR community. Interesting. I like it. How involved are you in, in deciding, um, you know, terminations if an employee is not working out? Is that something that you're very hands-on involved with? Luckily, uh, not my role today, uh, but I have been an HR partner before, um, you know, and I think, you know, number one, HR doesn't ever make those decisions, right? That's a manager's call. Yeah, HR, HR, HR supports and, you know, may advise uh, or legal may get involved, um, but the managers are the ones that make those final decisions on performance. And it's always a tough decision. I mean, you really, you want to um, really make those decisions in an objective way, but act warmly when you do exit somebody, right? Cause it's someone's life. Right. Yeah, and, absolutely. and maybe it wasn't a good fit for them, but they could fit someplace else. Yeah. Interesting. And, and how much responsibility in this day and age where mental health is so important, how much responsibility does a company have to really assess somebody an employee's mental state, before terminating them? How important is that? Know, that's a great question. I think it's out of my scope, but you have my depth. Uh, you know, I think it's an important question. I do think, I think it's fair to say that um, as things get brought up in HR or that someone has those concerns. Now, if an employee tells us they have some mental, mental challenges, you know, in, in disabilities, we obviously respond to that and provide the accommodations and understand, um, you know, but I think that's important. But I do think mental health is one of the definitely hot button issues, not only for all of us to be thinking about, uh, and how do we support those folks, right? And what kind of um, support really, frankly, just across the board do we need as a society? Uh, but in HR, I think it's always going to be, it's going to be your fault of the laws, but you want to do and how act with those people 
very warmly and figure out how you can support them. Awesome. And I, and I yeah. appreciate that. So what's on the radar for 2020? What are some of the big initiatives that you guys are working on over there that you could share? <clears throat> Sure. I mean, we've, um, you know, one of the big things we're focused on is continuing to elevate the service in the stores. And so we've been changing the culture um, over the last 18 months. And I have to say, Dick's Sporting Goods is an awesome place to work. It's a great culture. The people here are really engaged, excited. Um, they do live the brand. <clears throat> and our store managers and teammates in the stores, you know, the 40,000 teammates and, and store managers are awesome. And we kind of, we kind of challenged them. We were social media challenged, I guess, you know, we were had this social media really? policy from 1960. It was, um, people were afraid to go on social media as Dick Sporting Goods. It was really crazy. Oh, it was so bad. I mean, we actually had, we had, um, oh gosh, uh, MySpace was in the policy. So you know how old it was. If you can think about, it. Yeah, I mean, most people are listening. Needed no some updating. MySpace is all right. So, Friends, I think Friendster was in there too, right? <laughs> yeah. Friendster, MySpace. It was really bad. Hey, well I am. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so we, um, our president, Lauren Hobart, was starting to get on, we noticed on LinkedIn. And then Paloma Denardis, who runs our executive recruiting, had a big passion for this. And we came up with the hashtag, wait for it, it's brilliant, hashtag DSG life. Didn't take a long time to think about it. And uh, after coming our store manager conference, we started talking about it and moving through a real culture transformation around focusing on service and creating confidence and excitement for athletes. And really, it's taken off. And if you go to LinkedIn today and put hashtag DSG Life, we now have um, multiple posts. I mean, I would say probably 30, 40 posts a day from teammates across across the U.S. doing that. It's and branding. This year, it's, it's branding. Employer branding. Huh? It's employer branding. It's really talking about what it's like to work in the stores. It's great for the um, anyone who wants to be a customer for us. And we got to present at Talent Connect, which was awesome, obviously. And uh, great. That was honor. a good time. That was fun. That was yeah, good that was times a good time. we met. And then um, you know, and then the next thing is. So we've laid this foundation of what we call engage, excite, execute. And it's really about taking that to the next level with more focused training, um, especially in the moment, like moments that matter. And how do we kind of elevate that service experience? So that's what we're working on. Love it. And um, we will be training, probably training 40,000 teammates in April. That's our goal. So that's, uh, that's really exciting. We've got big a lot initiative. of work to do before that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a big one. JP, what do you love about working at Dick's? What do you love most about working at Dick's? the people i mean the people are great i mean it's um it's fun to be around sports and you know have you know i think that it's a great shopping environment i love everything we sell but you know when i look back the team is awesome uh the people here are smart they're collaborative they want to help the business we've got a lot of tenure um we also have you know some folks that have come here in the last few four three or four years to have a new perspective but everyone's open to change and everyone want to raise raise the bar so i think that part has been probably the best part about it uh, and the work has been fun. I mean, we just had our best, uh, our third quarter, we had 6% sales comps, which was our best results since 2013. Um, Wall Street Journal said we had the most foot traffic uh, year over year of any retailer. So like some things are going well, which is nice. And so when you're winning, right. it feels better. And especially in this in this world when you're competing against Amazon, like like having that, people still like to shop. They like to touch things. They like to feel it, right? right. Like you, right. Could, you, could, you could go online and you could buy a freaking basketball, right? But you want to go to the store and you want to feel the difference between the two of them. You want to actually bounce them, right? You want to try that golf right. club, um, you know, before you buy it, which is, which is so important too. So let's bring it home here. And these are questions that I love to ask every guest because the perspective is, is completely different here. Um, what does the word authentic mean to you? Mm. Yeah, authentic to me is just being true to who you are. And pretty much every moment. I mean, I think, you know, while we, of course, we are going to fake it till we make it sometimes, or we might add a little bit different, uh, you know, maybe a little more formal with certain people. At the end of the day, can, when people get to know you, they, they say, are you genuine? Like, is that really who you are? Or they kind of, you know, you're inauthentic when so they're kind of like, I'm not sure that I buy their answer. You know, and so I think being authentic is just being who you are, you know, day in and day out. I love it. I love it. And JP, what is, what is the greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on daily? Hmm. Probably the, be the best piece of advice, um, my dad, my dad was in the, who's, you know, rest in peace and uh, left us a little while ago, about 15 years ago, passed away. But he was in the gum and candy machine business, which is not a business a lot of people are in. And um, he built gum and candy machines. And so he taught me how to go out and build routes and uh, service these gum machines, right? And so he paid, put a quarter in and get a piece of bubble gum. And what my dad taught me was um, basically that, you know, he'd say, hey, dad, you know, I want to do something. He'd say one gumball at a time, right? I'd say, if I want to do something at school or I want to get a goal, he'd say one gumball at a time. It's like, how do you get rich? One gumball at a time. 
right? And the point of that is, it's the hard step. It's every step counts. You're never going to stop. Um, every one of those matters. You know, every one of those gumballs mattered for our family. And it's important for me to think about every day, like my work counts. And so every gumball, every gumball counts. That's, that's awesome. And JP, what would you say your superpower is, right? Like, what do you do so well, better than most anyone on this universe that really makes you awesome at, at, at who you are and what you do? <laughs> If we, uh, what's the opposite of superpower? My wife will be able to give that your, list for your you. Kryptonite. What's your kryptonite? Yeah. Yeah. Kryptonite <laughs> is my uh, DIY projects. Anything with an Ikea uh, oh, man. You know, manual, I'm the worst. And usually I start screaming about five minutes in. Um, That's yeah, a marriage stress test. <laughs> yeah. Ikea is a marriage stress test, right, of course. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm not very good at building things. I, and pretty much the Christmas now coming up and I – I know some things will be built incorrectly. All those kids' toys parts. and everything. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think superpower, um, it's a tough question. But I, I think for me, uh, it's always about innovating and coming up with new ideas and pushing the team to do that. That's, that's where I'm more of a status quo disruptor. Uh, might be my superpower in that way and trying to think a little bit differently, especially in the HR space, you know. Um, I dig it, man. And yep. last, last but not least, listen, man, day in, day out, things aren't always easy, right? Like things aren't, um, you know, you're, you're stepping in mud, you're locking your keys in the car door, you're dealing with internal challenges, kids are being a pain in the ass, right? But, you, but you're, you're digging down deep and, you, and you're finding that inner tenacity. And on the inverse of that, like some days are awesome, like all the love is coming in, everything is cooking for you, everything's great. And you want to show gratitude. JP, what is your North Star? What do you look up to? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's always about family and faith and, um, you know, which is cliche, but it's, it's true, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, my son is nine, my daughter's be seven here in March, uh, and my wife, I mean, she's amazing. Without my wife, it, none of this has ever come true. She's, <laughs> she's followed me to five states. She supported me. Um, she's an amazing mother. You know, she's really the, the rock of the family. But I think in the day when you come back and you kind of like had a bad day at work and then the kids want to hug you and have fun and they don't care about what happened. They, yeah, just want to, they just want to play some video games. They want to wrestle. That's kind of what really makes it all work. And that's what really matters. So um, I think faith and family. I love it, man. JP, thanks for coming on. Where could folks find you? Where, they, where can they connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Uh, JP, LA, PhD, Dick Sporting Goods. Look me up. That's awesome, man. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Adam. Great talking with you. Awesome. And in closing thoughts here, there's no one size fits all approach to talent acquisition. As companies get bigger, so do the complexities, issues, and ultimately the problems. And it takes super smart people like JP to understand true organizational psychology balanced with real world recruiting and talent acquisition operations. Managing and accounting for the human X factor at scale is a tremendous and it's a tremendous challenge and takes strategy and preparation and execution. And years of experience have enabled JP to manage people process, and drive talent at scale in large organizations, all while ensuring a positive candidate experience, ensuring that his team feels valued and appreciated. That's a lot of weight, man. And don't forget all the internal stakeholders. I mean, it's mind-boggling how he balances all this, and it's no easy task, but I can tell that he genuinely enjoys his work, and he loves what he, do, loves what he do, does and is a tremendous mentor. And I appreciate and thank you, JP, for your time and giving us a sneak peek into the world of dicks and I look forward to continuing our relationship and finding synergies. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. Good stuff. It's everyone listening. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Please be sure to click, link, subscribe. Remember, take your online offline and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode jam-packed with more incredible humans. For more info, please visit www.nhptalentgroup.com.